Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to another episode of Movie House Memories, the podcast where we look back and review the films that we think are the most important films in cinema history. I'm Patrick, and with me this week are two people who spent a large portion of their lives in darkened movie theaters. First, he's our resident lumberjack and the man who sees symbolism in his cornflakes. He's one of the co-hosts of the Criterion Critics and Lunchtime Movie Review podcast and has his own YouTube channel called Viewing and Reviewing. Yes. Bobby Taylor. And I'm only here because I am Patrick's toy. Okay. <laughs> are we reviewing? I'm the- under hypnosis. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, are we reviewing Richard Pryor's The Toy this week? I just. <laughs> also with us, she has appeared as one of the co hosts of the Sunday Seconds with the Duke, the John Wayne Retrospective podcast, as well as the Golden Age of the Silver Screen podcast here on the MHN Podcast Network. The sole female voice of the show and my podcast better half. Lori Flores. Patrick is the most amazing podcaster I've ever heard in my life. And that's the smartest thing. That's what I was going to say. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome, everyone. And before we get started, we'd like to thank all the returning listeners to the show and welcome all new listeners to Movie House Memories. Thanks for giving us a try. We appreciate your time and attention and hope you keep on listening and following us on Pinterest or Twitter at MH Memories. On either one of those social media outlets, you can keep informed about our occasional written film reviews and film summaries news on upcoming theatrical releases and trailers and information on many upcoming podcasts on the mhm podcast network additionally you can also now subscribe to our account on youtube where we're releasing our podcasts exclusively if you subscribe to our account there you can get updates as to when we put new material on the youtube channel as well as give us a like or a dislike or even leave a comment about the films that we've reviewed, our opinions about said films, or even a suggestion for a film you think should be in the top 100 films of all time. And whether you are a frequent listener or a brand new fan of our little show, we hope that you take the time after you're done listening to provide us with a little feedback. If you've listened to us on YouTube, as I said before, you can give us a like or a dislike or leave a comment about the show. You could also visit visit our website at moviehousememories.com and leave a comment either there about our podcasts, our opinions, or the film that we are reviewing. Finally, on our website, you can also leave your star review rating, the film that we discussed, so that we can get a consensus rating from the MHN Podcast Network community. As always, we love to hear positive feedback, but we appreciate anything anyone has to say about any of our little shows. Now, with the horrible business out of the way, let's get on to Lori's next pick for one of the greatest films of all time, 1962's The Manchurian Candidate. And Lori, do you have a summary for us? I don't remember writing it, but I have one. (laughs) Can you tell me a story? The Manchurian Candidate, 1962, starring Frank Sinatra, Lawrence Harvey, Angela Lansbury, and Janet Leigh. Korean War veteran Bennett Marco suffers from recurring nightmares about his former platoon. He dreams that Raymond Shaw, the Medal of Honor winner that he believes was responsible for saving his life, murdered two fellow soldiers. We witness what Marco sees as a botany club meeting of elderly women, which is in reality a demonstration by Korean military officials of their success brainwashing his platoon. Marco is uneasy and thinks there is more to his nightmares. When he learns that another platoon member is having the exact same dream, he decides to investigate. The U.S. military becomes interested when they realize that both former soldiers are describing the same communist leaders. Shaw, the murderer in the night terrors, is the stepson of U.S. Senator John Island. Raymond has an unhealthy relationship with his manipulative mother, Eleanor Island. Eleanor seeks to advance the career of her senator husband through a communist witch hunt. Spoiler alert, 
She is a secret Soviet agent. Eleanor's misdeeds have caught up to her as the communists, unbeknownst to her, chose her son Raymond to be the assassin to help them gain control of the White House. Eleanor is the final step in the plot to lead the assassin to his American political targets. Raymond has been brainwashed to obey any command given to him after he views a Queen of Diamonds card. We also learn that Raymond never committed the courageous deeds that earned him a Medal of Honor. His platoon was programmed to falsely remember Raymond saving their lives. Raymond reignites romance and marries Jocelyn Jordan, the daughter of another senator. Raymond genuinely falls in love with Jocelyn and loves spending time with her family. Shockingly, Raymond calmly murders Senator Jordan and his beloved Jocelyn and has no memory of it. Marco's digging leads him to figuring out the role of the Queen of, Di- of, the Queen of Diamonds card. He shows Raymond that card in an attempt to deprogram him. Eleanor gives Raymond his orders to assassinate the party's presidential candidate. She explains the situation to an unresponsive Raymond and gives him an incestuous kiss. With the favored candidate out of the way, this operation is intended to win the election of Soviet patsy Senator Iceland, the Manchurian candidate, as the president of the United States. Eleanor is angry at the communist leaders for their misuse of her son and vows to get even with them. Raymond puts himself in position to kill the other presidential candidate and looks as if Marco's attempt to free Raymond from the Soviet mind control has failed. Raymond has the candidate in the crosshairs when he suddenly turns his gun and shoots his stepfather and mother. He then commits suicide in front of Marco. Symbolically, Raymond is wearing the Medal of Honor that he may have finally earned. And that's the Manchurian candidate. Well, you just kind of spoiled my my symbolism and meanings. <laughs> Did I do that? I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, if Lori picked it up, (laughs) if Lori picked it up, it was pretty obvious anyways, Bobby. (laughs) (laughs) Burn. (laughs) Let's get to my news. Yes. All right. Uh, (laughs) Films are influenced by the times they're made in. And we look at back at some of the big headlines of the time and Lori Flores' headlines of the time. The year was 1962. In what became known as the Cuban Missile Crisis, U.S. President John F. Kennedy imposed a naval blockade on Cuba demanding the removal of Soviet nuclear missiles. Marilyn Monroe was found dead of a drug overdose. Johnny Carson became the new host of The Tonight Show. The first Walmart opened. Spider-Man debuted in a comic. And films released in 1962 included Dr. No, Carnival of Souls, The Music Man, Lawrence of Arabia, To Kill a Mockingbird, The Longest Day, and the film we're discussing tonight, The Manchurian Candidate. And that's a look at 1962. All right, Lori, I will give you total props and respect if you can name the comic book and the issue that oh, Spider-Man appeared in. I, I've known this because we went to a Marvel exhibit when I was visiting Molly in Seattle and I can't remember, <laughs> but I, they actually had a copy of it. Oh, wow. And it, it was under glass, but oh. they had it. Um, shoot. I don't remember. I physically Marvel. Seen- it would be a Marvel comic. Yeah, it would be a Marvel comic, but <laughs> Marvel is not in the title. Was it issue one? No, no. It was the final issue of a series. I don't remember. When you say it, I'll remember, but I don't know. Bobby, do you know? Nope. All right. Amazing Fantasy, number 15. Yeah, I can see how I forgot that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never knew it. It was it, the comic was being canceled, and they let Stan Lee do whatever he wanted with the comic. And, he's, and he said, "I want to introduce this character, Spider Man." Yeah, sure, kid, go ahead. Who cares? <laughs> and the rest is history. Anyways, back to something a little <laughs> less interesting. Uh, <laughs> that Marvel exhibit was really cool. You would have liked it. I would have. I've I've actually seen one 
copy of Amazing Fantasy number 15 myself once in my life. I saw it in a comic book store on sale, and this was back in the 80s. And it was like 1982, 1983. They were selling it for at that point a thousand dollars. And if I had a a thousand, well, I do have a thousand dollars. That I, if it was a thousand dollars today, I would buy it on site without question, just because just to have that piece of history. But now it goes for tens of thousands of dollars. There's, I mean, it's ridiculous. Wow. Anyways, we usually start by talking about the casting, and this is no different, and we'll start with Frank Sinatra playing Major Bennett Marco, uh, one of the driving forces in the creation of this particular film. Laurie, what did you think of Mr. Sinatra's performance in The Manchurian Candidate? He was really good. It was really impressive. I mean, I forgot that I was watching Frank Sinatra, but he was really sweaty. (laughs) That's it? You're going to end with he was really sweaty? <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope that was makeup and not actually him. Because Lawrence was uh, Lawrence Harvey, as Raymond, was doing exactly the yeah, same thing. Yeah, it wasn't just so, him. <laughs> yeah, maybe they weren't sitting in the same sauna. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I will agree with Lori. I thought he did a really good job, and I didn't believe that I was watching the normal Frank Sinatra that I've seen in, in umpteen million movies uh, before this time. Because I'm not a big Sinatra fan overall, but I thought in this movie he did very well. And I did hear he was a one-take Charlie. He came in and he did his first take, and then he it went downhill from there. So for him to pull off this this good of a job in his first take was pretty impressive. You know, I, I am a fan of Frank Sinatra, not no, necessarily for his acting. I thought he was a decent actor. Uh, you know, he did a, a lot of films that I somewhat enjoy watching. Uh, I'm mainly more of a fan of his music, but I will agree that this is probably one of his better acting performances. And this is a project that he helped shepherd into creation. Uh, So I think that's probably why he was, he, for be quite honest with you, probably gave a shit. (laughs) And that's why he he was there. Not like oceans 11 where they were filming during the, the late afternoon gambling and drinking during the night and getting up about noon to go and, and shoot the movie. Uh, You know, that, it, you know, this is something I think he uh, put a lot of heart and soul and thought into a project he really wanted to develop. And, you know, I did read also that, you know, and I've known for quite some time that he he didn't like to do multiple takes. He he believed he got this best performance out of the first take, uh, the spontaneity of it all, at all. But it, it, kind of come back against your criticism that although he is was considered as he didn't like to do multiple takes of a shot he was very very willing to rehearse and he would rehearse it Mm -hmm. with other actors ahead of time he just didn't like to be on set and wasting a lot of people's time what you know it almost comes across to me though is that he didn't like to work and basically (laughs) that's why he would come in he'd he'd prepare and then he would come in for one shot and say okay we're done and move on so i mean there's a lot of people that like to do 20 takes and there's guys or girls that like to do one and done yeah. and it's and then go back to my my air conditioned uh hotel room and or you know my penthouse hotel room in sinatra's case and and enjoy the rest of the day yeah maybe i don't know what about lawrence harvey playing raymond shaw in the film you know i he's a very interesting character i i, I think it, and as an actor, I, I read up on his background as well. I think he, they caught lightning in a bottle with him. I don't think he's a great actor overall. I, I really think he's very, very stiff and cold and just basically not not a quality actor. But as Raymond Shaw, I thought he was perfection. I really, really liked how he played that character uh, as being a programmed person in an icy relationship with pretty much everybody in his life he was isolated from everybody so this was a a stroke of genius casting him i really really liked him yeah i agree with everything that bobby just said i i think he played the character perfectly in my opinion i just well i remember seeing this movie as a kid and it really scared me and i really believed (laughs) everything that i saw and and watching it again, it had been a long time since I'd seen it. All of the acting performances are amazing. You, you know, it's weird. As Bobby brings up about Lawrence Harvey playing kind of cold and rigid. But mm-hmm. I almost feel that's the character he's supposed to be. 
He's yes. He's not supposed to. And, and it, it, cause I, I agree with you when I was watching this, I was going, God, I really don't like him as an actor. <laughs> and, but in, as I was watching the film, but I'm not supposed to like him. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's supposed to be the contradiction is that all these guys say these wonderful things about him, but realize that he's not that guy. And, you know, for uh, Marco to, you know, like, Hey, this is what I'm going to say, but I know that's not the case. And so I agree with you. That's kind of this, this brilliance in casting is that I, I can't say I'm really familiar with a lot of his work. Um, I've probably seen him something else and I'm, I'm forgetting it right now. I always remember him for this w- role, but as, as I was watching it this time, I'm going, I'm not supposed to like him. He's supposed to be the villain, you know, to a certain extent, I'm supposed to be sympathetic towards it, but is he really that much of a sympathetic character? Cause he wasn't asked everybody before. No, no one liked him. That's the whole, his whole backstory is no one liked him, you know, other than the girl that he ultimately chooses not to, to marry. But I I had a greater appreciation for that casting and his performance in the film, watching it this time than I had in other times that I thought he, he did a really, really good job in that. And the fact that at the end of the day, I'm not supposed to like him and I don't. (laughs) So therefore it was a great acting performance. Uh, let's talk about Angela Lansbury playing Miss Eleanor Shaw Iceland. Lori, what did you think of Miss Lansbury in this film? You know, I didn't even remember that it was Angela Lansbury that played. I, I didn't. I don't think I knew who she was when I first saw this. You know, wow, she is so cold and so calculating and so against the roles that I know her for. I loved it. She was so good. I will agree with Lori. This is something that most of the time people remember her from the the murder murder, she wrote. murder mystery. Yeah, there you go. Murder she wrote as the lovable grandma that solves all the mysteries, and you never see her in that cold, manipulative bitch role that she played really, really well in this. And I remember watching her um, back in the forties. I, I mean, I wasn't in the forties, but watching uh, the dorian gray movie that she was the young debutante uh singer and to see her go from that to this to murder she wrote is such a change for her character she almost went backwards in in a positive way and i just i really really loved her in this role Uh, she was somebody that you're not supposed to like but yet it's angela lansbury how do you not like her (laughs) <laughs> but she was a tough character in the Harvey girls too. Okay. I didn't see that one, but she, I really liked her in this role. And I, I can't, I can't think of another woman of that era that would have probably been as good other than maybe like Joan Crawford type, or maybe Betty Davis could have pulled it off. But to have a nice lady playing this role was really cool. You know, uh, very similar to that is I remember Angela Lansbury for a lot of like, uh, not, I don't want to say necessarily heroic characters, but to a lot of good characters. Uh, obviously I, I wasn't a big fan of, uh, murder. She wrote in the television series, but I definitively remembered her for bed dobs and broomsticks when I was a kid. <laughs> and, you know, and then obviously was it Mrs. Potts and, yes. and the beauty and the beast, and I've seen her in other roles here and there, but I, I could not recall a, a, an outright villainous role like this film. Uh, that that was a little unusual for me. And but that being said, I thought it was I thought it was a great performance. I thought she did a really good job. Now I didn't necessarily believe her as Lawrence Harvey's mother because I think she was only two or three years older than him. <laughs> Right, but uh, that I, I thought she gave a great performance in a role that was pretty crucial to to the film uh, to make this film utterly believable. I did think it was interesting that the book has a lot of more incestuous, uh, a much more incestuous relationship between you know Shaw and his mother, but I, I didn't get that overwhelming sense in this film. And I don't think it was necessarily necessary for the, the story they needed to tell. I think that might have been too too much of a turnoff for some audiences in 1962. But I thought she did a great performance. Controversies. We don't always talk about controversies, but I was kind of surprised. 
a, l- a little surprised. Obviously, the, there's the controversy of, you know, there's a brainwashing that Lori thinks isn't real anymore, I guess. You don't you, you don't think it, it still exists? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> I took Psych 101 okay. <laughs> in college. And the, we did this thing about hypnotism and pretty much what I took away from it. And I don't know how accurate this was. This was just my experience. But I don't really know anything about psychology. But it seemed like to be hypnotized, you had to kind of be very suggestive. And to me, it seemed like you had to want to be hypnotized. So I just, until then, I believed, wow, somebody could hypnotize you. That's so scary. And then when I saw it trying to be practiced unsuccessfully, and maybe it was just a bad, I don't know, a bad hypnotist, but it just seemed like a bunch of malarkey to me. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it happens all the time now, except the hypnotist is called social media and people believe whatever they fucking read. So <laughs> yeah, that's a much true. better hypnotist. Yes. <laughs> than, the, so, than the look into my eyes. We have a world very full of, sleepy. Yeah, we have a world full of Manchurian <laughs> candidates now. But, but uh, you know, I, I think you, you t- you're touching on something, though, that I think that the, the filmmakers in this film did a really good job that I don't think the remake did with the Denzel Washington version. Denzel's version, they would, they had a lot of just kind of where he was remembering part of the the brainwashing portion of it, uh, and it was more brutal, uh, torturous type of things. And in this film here, I they didn't really go into how they got hypnotized as much as while they were hypnotized, you saw things that they were seeing and, and doing. And I think they did the wise choice by not showing the audience exactly how the guys how the how the the members of the platoon were fully hypnotized because I think that could have been very brutal. The tortures could have been really something that would have turned people's stomachs and uh, and. I think by keeping it a little more vanilla, it, it was more effective for us in the end. And it's not crucial to the story. It's, right. It does not. I mean, yeah, you may be able to get a, you know, a five minute sequence out of this torturous behavior, but at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily make you relate to these characters any better than just yep. seeing the, the outcome of they went through brainwashing and now these are who they are and they can do these horrible, horrible acts, uh, even though in, in real life, in their, in their right minds, they wouldn't do such things. <laughs> but anyways, the controversy I was getting to is this film didn't play in a lot of uh, Iron Curtain countries uh, until the 19, uh, I think the 1990s in some cases, uh, due to the kind of the criticism of communism. And I, I very th- much thought that this was so much an interesting product at the time that based off, you know, the communist witch hunts of the 1950s. I mean, this is granted this is coming in the 1960s. They were well behind us, but, you know, they weren't that far behind us. And I would have thought this was a far more controversial film in its time, but I didn't find anything about that at all. And Lori, maybe, I mean, you're, you're more of the history major than I am. I mean, I always think that the, the, you know, McCarthy hearings and everything ended in like 1955, 1956, correct? I don't remember the exact years, but that sounds right. And I mean, in the aftermath of that, I mean, how many people's careers were, were damaged and how many people were blacklisted and. Correct. I mean, the, I mean, the, the after effects, people were blacklisted for many years. Some of them into the 1980s, they didn't start getting work again or had to get work under a pseudonym so that they, they could just earn a steady paycheck. But they kind of, the way that they have the ice, you know, Senator Iceland throwing around, you know, communist allegations willy nilly, uh, you know, I thought that was probably a, a very controversial, controversial feeling at this time. And in addition to that, very timely now. <laughs> and the fact that, mm-hmm. You just have to make the allegation. You just have to say something as if it's true. And it is because people Mm -hmm. report that it's true and the word spreads. And you know, that there, that aspect of the film is it's still very relatable to today's times. Sure. Yeah. This is a timeless story based on today's uh, political 
history that's going on right before our eyes. If you were to watch this movie today, you'd be going, oh, my gosh, they just called the hist." You know, I mean, basically, it was the Diet Pepsi button that put him under hypnotism. I don't I mean, for all we know, it, it's it, it, this is really eerie how they called their shot in 1962. And also about the blacklist, if you think about it, Spartacus was the the. Uh, the breaking of the blacklist for the, the last time in Hollywood, and that was only filmed in 1960. It's only two years earlier than this. So, so in Hollywood's mind, in particular, this was a very, very momentous story of the day, and it probably would have rubbed a whole bunch of people wrong, especially in a um, the Cold War situation that they were in at the time. I mean, the uh, Laura, you mentioned about Kennedy's. Bay of the Pigs issue with with Cuba. I mean, that was you as a country. We were in a really bad situation, and and this called a lot of that out. And if I can totally see why the communist countries or the communist bloc, at least, would have would have been up in arms over mm -hmm. this. It's this calling when, them the, all yeah. the bad guys. So this is like the hype of people having home bomb shelters, kids yep. having. Nuclear drills in school and yeah, Bobby. What about symbolism and hidden meetings, or did Lori ruin it all for you? Lori ruined it all. <laughs> so <laughs> all right, okay. we'll just go on then. Yeah, um, I do have three of them. Lori's already uh, broached one of them, but I do have uh, Private Bobby Limbeck of Raymond's Squad was considered their mascot and too young for anything meaningful, so he symbolized the in incorruptible America that the communist captors chose to destroy with their assassins uh, with their assassin built to kill anyone that got in the way of their greater plan. When Raymond pulls the trigger to kill Bobby, all hope for peace and innocence in America is lost. The Queen of Diamonds symbolized not only the trigger card for Raymond's special orders, but it came to symbolize his American handler, which was his rich and powerful mother who wanted to be Queen of America once her idiot husband became president. And as Lori stated, the Medal of Honor came to symbolize what was evil and despicable in Raymond's eyes. When he puts it around his neck at the finale, he is not only removing himself from this world, but all the corruption and lies the medal came to represent to he and his squ uh, squadron comrades. I didn't go that deep. <laughs> <laughs> you said he earned it finally. <laughs> that was really good. I didn't even think about the Queen of being symbolic of his mother that was really good no i actually that's my favorite of the three i think that yeah it's, it's it's right there and it's obvious and i i didn't even catch it until uh you ju just said it and i said that makes so much more sense it does it does well and, and i gotta ask as a it's not really symbolism but hidden meaning I had read that the Janet Lee character, which came out of nowhere in the middle of the movie and literally went nowhere <laughs> after the movie got going, yeah. she she was a total red herring. And I'm, but I had yeah. also read that she was some sort of a double agent, which I never saw any of that in there. Did you guys see anything with her no, character? No, I I don't think she she was, but but. Yeah, I agree because I kept I hadn't seen it for a while, and I was like, "Is she? I don't remember. Is she something?" But then they I didn't see anything. Did you, Patrick? No, not at all. Yeah, I, she <laughs> kind of. If it wasn't Janet Lee, would have not really mattered. <laughs> they could have cut her completely out of the movie and yeah. wouldn't have missed missed a beat. Not a. But beat. I love Janet Lee. But oh yeah. As the mm -hmm. actress is fine, yeah. But I actually liked the Jocelyn character a lot, and I just realized tonight that I didn't. Re I had seen her in the original, or not the original, but the 1959 version of Lil Abner. Uh, she was Daisy May, so that was cool to see the her because I knew I'd seen her face before, but I didn't know where. But she's also if you if. I could also say that it could be a hidden meaning with the Raymond character not realizing that he finally is in a loving relationship with with Jocelyn and her father, uh, Senator Jordan, and instead he chooses to go down the path of murdering them to remove any form of love in his life so that he will never – he will always be in an icy relationship no matter what in the future. There's that as well. 
All right. Well, Matt, unfortunately, did not join us tonight, and I did not get a lot of heads up for it, or normally I would come up with something for his moral universe. Obviously, th there's a lot of morality in this. Uh, we've kind of touched upon it, Lori's skepticism as to uh, brainwashing or hypnotism, if you will, the idea that you're capable of doing a lot of things, even it go, uh, goes against your moral compass, uh, if, you know, apparently if you're just shown the right cards or played the, uh, the right deck, if you will. Uh, but th there's something about, I want to ask about somewhat the Bennett Marco character is that he knows Shaw is kind of this bomb, you know, he, and he repeatedly keeps believing in his better nature and not bringing him, bringing him in and letting him go to the point where he has to chase him down at the end, right before he kills his mother and his stepfather. And I want to kind of get your take on what, what you think that is saying about what he's believed. Do you believe he's acting from this belief that he's a good man? Because he didn't seem to like Shaw <laughs> at all before, you know, his opinions as to whether he was a good soldier or not, or a reliable soldier, but he didn't seem to like the guy, but he keeps seeming to want to believe in his better nature. And do you think that's, the brainwashing or do you think that's something about the character and potentially uh, uh, to the screenwriters and the filmmakers to say that we want to believe that this, this person can be this heroic type character. I, I think they wanted a hero. I, I really do. And I just, uh, something I forgot to say in my defense about the questioning of brainwashing, remember the um, subliminal message thing where they said they put, they put stuff in movies and then people bought more concessions. Yeah. And, and uh, that was, they later admitted that that wasn't true. So that's why I'm so skeptical. <laughs> I believe well, that too. We're doing it to you right now. You just don't know it till, till next podcast. I knew it. <laughs> right now you're thinking, I want to watch a Jim Carrey movie next. That's what you just keep thinking to yourself. So. <laughs> In your mind, you're going, what's a good one in the top 100? The mask? No. Cable guy? <laughs> Must remove Gigi. <laughs> Must remove Gigi. Yes. No more pedophiles in the top 100. Oh, stop it. So, Bobby, uh, we've drifted from my point, but... <laughs> I, I think that the the Marco character had a focus on doing the right thing. But I think that was more the Sinatra actor slash producer of this film that was doing the right thing. Because if you were to you, to do um, logic, use logic in, in the way they did this film, Shaw would have been covered 24-7. He never would have been out of, out of anybody's eyesight, especially once Marco brought up the fact that he was obviously under dis, uh, under duress and and they had the, the Queen of Diamonds as the, as the trigger point. They never would have let him go again. Uh, and, and to leave it all up to Marco, and, and Marco, by the way, kept screwing up, and they yeah. just kept letting him screw up over and over again. But it was Sinatra's character, and he's the producer of the film. Um, so they're not going to block him from doing that. That he would have been in, in real life, he would have been taken off that uh, as soon as they found out that he was brainwashed himself. They would have taken him off the the detail and put somebody capable and un, untrusting of Shaw at, in the lead at that point. But that's not a movie. So I, I think that's that has. That that's mainly what I think the Marco character got wrong. He was trying to do the right thing, yes, but he was he should have been already out of the picture by that time. But as far as the moral universe, I mean, we're talking murder, incest, you know, following your parents. Uh, I mean, if you're just talking Ten Commandments wise, this thing has broken all kinds of rules. So it, it's it really is an amoral story that the the Marco character is just trying to do the right thing at the last minute. And ultimately the, the payoff at the end was the good guys win by the bad guy being taken out by his own hand. Well, 
and I guess that's what I'm trying to kind of say about this. As you, as you just point out, this is an extremely dark and pessimistic film. The, you know, this idea that the enemies are among us and not only they are among us, they're in power and trying to elevate to greater power. Uh, and, it's your own mother. Uh, well, uh, uh, and, who was an operative of the Russians? <laughs> cor- correct. <laughs> yeah, you're going even more personal. Who's your uh, the the enemies are your own mother as well, but you know, and potentially your incestuous mother if you read the book. But you know that there is a lot. You know, there is darkness all over this character, uh, all over this story, and this idea that Marco, as you said, kind of keeps screwing up is once they know that he is potentially their target in a real world situation, they just arrest Shaw. He's compromised. Yes. Well, and Marco, they would have arrested Marco as an, as an accomplice, Correct. even though he didn't know what was happening. Correct. But they keep giving him a leash. And even though, you know, oh, I kind of messed up, I shouldn't have let him go, especially after they've, you know, tried to essentially deprogram him. He is a living <laughs> weapon. And they kind of just, okay, we'll leave him here and he'll be fine. I, I just want to, you know, and my thought is when I was watching this, what were the filmmakers, were they trying to convey that this glimmer of hope that we have to let, one, we have to let this character go. You know, he can't just escape. He can't be helped to escape. He has to, he has to be redeemed by his own hand, you know, even if he's going to take his life at the very end. But that Marco is kind of this, this symbolic character for the audience. And we want to believe in good, that good ultimately will outweigh whatever evil influence has, has had on this character with that good will ultimately shine through. Uh, and, and we want to believe that exists. That's how I saw it. But the thing is, is that good would have turned out. See, if leaving it in the hands of Marco, bad happened because he was one step behind Shaw the entire movie, including at the very end where you have both the senator and Mrs. Shaw or whatever, Miss Isley. Island murdered in front of our eyes. That didn't have to happen. They're innocent victims as far as the government is concerned because the government, had they have shut down Marco, had they have shut down Shaw, good wins out, justice prevails, everybody lives, and we move forward with our lives. And that's not what happened here. They put it all on Marco to resolve the issue with Shaw. Shaw murders innocents, which they aren't, but that's to us. We know that, but the general public wouldn't know that. And and now and then Shaw kills himself and Marco's just standing there witnessing the event. And and that's like you said, it's a pessimistic ending versus watching how justice prevails, which is what the audience wanted in that day. Wow. Bobby has a much more negative outlook than I do on this film, but I, I tend to lean more towards what Lori said. But. What's that? Uh, that? It's that Marco is supposed to be the eyes of the audience, the conscious. We want mm-hmm. to believe in good, that we want to believe that this character can overcome it because I, I don't necessarily believe that he's two steps behind Shaw. In fact, halfway through the film, I think he's caught up to Shaw and overcomes him and even knows that these things are going on yet. He wants Shaw to prevail. He wants Shaw to overcome. And and I think that's supposed to be the access point for the audience, for the audience to make it more relatable. I, you know, it's it's weird because I've only seen the Denzel Washington uh, version once. I've seen this version about yeah. four or five times in the Denzel Washington. And I remember that as a much more pessimistic film of playing mm-hmm. almost like a cat and mouse trying to catch up to the to the plot, where in this, they caught up to the plot. They didn't necessarily know what the the objective was, but they knew who the weapon was. They knew who the character was, you know, who, who, who was brainwashed and what they were trying to do. And yet they let him continue to operate. And, and, and and from Marco's belief, almost like we, we want to have that belief that this person can be the good person, you know, Oh, he's, he's reunited with his past love. He's a changed man. You know, so I'm not going to, I'm, he came to get him and said, I'll give you a couple days or something like that. And then leaves, you know, it's like, but that's, that's exactly my point though, is that the Jordan murders the, the, her own, his own wife, he's murdered at that point. 
should have been they shut down the the project. It's mm-hmm. over. We have a murderer addre- arrest him and put him in jail. And you know there goes the weapon is now off the streets, and and he can be prosecuted to the extent of the law. Instead, it's oh you know what I know maybe that it, it maybe could have been him that killed his wife and his father in law very easily. It could have been anybody else, but I'll give you a, a second chance. And he slipped through the net a, a huge huge hole in the net that should have been tied around him by that time it, it, that the last sequence where they're at the uh, the whatever it is the political thing the rally it, that should never have even been entered into our movie um, had they done the right thing and and arrested him on the spot well i just thought they were and well, i have no proof of this but i just felt like they were flushing out the people involved but you're right. He never should have been allowed to have a gun and be in that position to – unless they wanted him to – I don't know. He he should have had not one tail but the entire Department of Justice yeah. tail, no, knowing he's a loose cannon that is a known murderer and is a weapon ready to kill the next person. They would have had him pegged everywhere. He wouldn't have gone anywhere without some many people on top of him. Uh, and, and, it wouldn't have been as dramatic an ending. Yeah, and, That's what I mean. And, and, it's for the movie's purpose. Correct, and I, and I absolutely agree with you, Bobby. I don't disagree with you on any po- point of that. But they made a conscious choice as to storytelling to say, we're going to let this guy off the leash. And that's why I think that they're trying to make the Marco character more accessible to have that this belief, which is is very weird because I don't tend to think of Sinatra characters as optimistic. (laughs) I I tend to think of him as pretty pessimistic or pretty real world. But I, I almost think he was naive in that regard. Yes, very good word there. But once again, the the real world, real world versus movie world is yes. not the same thing because no. logic, Marco would have been off the case months ago. Oh yes, I absolutely so agree with it, you on that. But plus, Marco was able to overcome this. You know, his brain was altered, but there was such goodness inside him that he was able to overcome that and realize what was going on. It's a good way of looking at it, and I would hope that that would have been the character, and in the end, after this was all said and done, Marco would live a full life out from under that hypnosis. But honestly, I don't remember – they. I don't remember in the film, and maybe you can uh, refresh my memory here. They never said how he – was ever put under because it was just Shaw that was the queen of queen of diamonds, right? They didn't say anything about how Marco went under or was there? No, no. So, so he came out on his own. And so, I mean, to be honest, you know, six years from now, as he's working in the department of justice, working as an assistant, you know, assistant attorney general. And the next thing you know, they go, well, he's going to become attorney general. If this guy dies, well, you know, here's the, the king of spades. And now Sinatra is a, an assassin to kill that guy. And now he's the attorney general of the United States. I that mean, should have been the Denzel plot. <laughs> I'm just thinking that, you know, that it, it, it it left that huge plot point left open how Sinatra can just, you know, snap of his fingers and he's out of it. And Shaw is still under, even though he's been deprogrammed, he's still under. That's kind of a cheat. Going on to music. Uh, the score is composed, uh, unlike what my notes say <laughs> by David Amram. And this was one of his earlier compositions in his careers. He's still making movies and composing music to this day, although a lot less well-known music, mainly for documentaries and short films. But uh, this was one of, as I said, one of his earliest performances. He also did music for Splendor in the Grass uh, and The Young Savages uh, back in the 1960s as well. Bobby, what did you think of the the composition in this film? Well, I'm I'm going to say what Matt usually says. It didn't bother me. I, did, it, I didn't really pay attention to it, so it didn't really didn't really affect me. I will say, though, that the fact that you have Frank Sinatra in your film and you don't have Frank Sinatra singing, uh, not not the character, but just a Frank Sinatra song uh, somewhere in the soundtrack would have been nice to have nice to have heard. Otherwise, it was fine. I don't see anything special about it or not. 
Yeah, but he didn't put a lot of his. He didn't have songs in a lot of his music uh, films. He's in musicals. There is musicals. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't believe there's a Frank Sinatra song in Ocean's Eleven. There's a Dean Martin song, but there's not a Frank Sinatra song. Like I said, I would have liked to have heard it, especially since he was a producer on the film, yeah. and especially with the the iconic. Uh, Sinatra voice by that time it would have been nice to have him singing a song just for uh, nostalgia if nothing else from my perspective that's all I'm not knocking it I'm just saying I wish they would have done something like that yeah I liked the music it didn't particularly stand out to me either but um, it was I I liked it but I I disagree because I I had forgotten that I was watching Frank Sinatra so I think playing a Sinatra song would have pulled me back and distracted me. So I, I, I'm glad that they didn't. Although, so I, I'll just go on my playlist and listen to one. <laughs> well, it would have been like uh, how Barbara Streisand was in The Way We Were, and they played her song throughout, and that was, that took me out of the film. And then I was watching Barbara the singer acting. And I think if they would have done Sinatra singing the closing credits out, it wouldn't have taken me out of the film. I would have still respected his acting just fine. Well, as to score, um, I thought the score was forgettable. <laughs> it did not resonate with me. It didn't distract me, which is a good thing uh, where I go, wow, this music is really not doesn't flow with the film, but it also wasn't very memorable. So I, I, it's neither here nor there. And for as far as the Frank Sinatra song, I'm, I, I'm hard pressed to think other than the musicals, a, the, a, a film having a Frank Sinatra song. I mean, did you see a Frank Sinatra song in Cannonball Run too, Bobby? Did you see it? Come on. <laughs> Lori's going, he was in Cannonball Run too. <laughs> Filmed he here was. in Tucson, Lori. You Filmed did here. hypnotize me. Yes. <laughs> they filmed the scene with Frank Sinatra at old Tucson. I've never seen, I don't think I've seen the whole movie. So mm-hmm. I didn't know that arguably arguably the last rat pack movie because it has dean martin sammy davis jr and frank frank sinatra all together fun trivia yeah but i I would say that's a that's a loose argument (laughs) all right ending of the film all right uh, in the movie raymond shaw kills uh senator iceland and his mother of course uh and then kills himself and a suicide however the book is different and that it concludes with Raymond uh, committing the murders and then his suicide after being ordered to do so by Marco, which severely changes that character. So I'm asking you, what do you guys think of the ending and what do you guys think of the ending for the book and which one would you like better? Um, I like the movie ending better. That's a, that's really dark having Marco and, and I saw him as a hero. So that just, blew that out so i'm i'm get i like i prefer the movie 100 percent agree with Lori. i think that had we have seen marco do that i believe that that my scenario of not knowing what would have set marco off would have been the reason that would have set marco off and now he becomes the lethal weapon at the end i like i like the i like the movie much better now i have not read the novel and i have just that brief synopsis of what the summary is but I somewhat, I got to say, I kind of like the novel better because I think this is a dark and pessimistic film and has this twinge of, 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 uh, you know, optimism. But I think that fits better with the, the film is to have that true pessimism and the fact that, you know, Marco doesn't believe that this character can be saved and, it's an instrument to eliminate the enemies of the United States. Marco's still a heroic character, but he's a heroic character that, you know, has that shades of gray that gets things done. You know, that these, these are threats to the United States and you have a method to take them out and, and you use the weapon against the enemy in a, a way that they didn't foresee. And I like that ending. I like that perspective. I, I don't think it would have been a blockbuster hit and I don't think audiences would have accepted it, but I like the ending. It's very un-Hollywood. All right. Films legacy nominated for two Academy awards, winning none. 
Uh, loss, Best Supporting Actress, Angela Lansbury lost to Patty Duke in The Miracle Worker. And uh, Lost Best Film Editing, uh, lost to Ultimate Best Picture winner of that year, Lawrence of Arabia. American Film Institute has it on two lists. In 1998, it was number 67 on AFI's Top 100 Greatest American Movies list. However, when they redid the list in 2007, uh, it was dropped off. So it didn't even make the top 100 on the second go around. Uh, in 2001, it was placed at number 17 on AFI's uh, 100 Years, 100 Thrills list. Uh, in 2007, Angela Lansbury's character was selected by Time Magazine as one of the 25 greatest villains in cinema history. Uh, is included in the book. The movie is included in the book, A Thousand and One Movies You Must See Before You Die. Uh, made Roger Ebert's great movies list and was placed in the National Film Registry at the Library of Congress in 1994. Uh, was re remade in 2004 with Denzel Washington, Meryl Streep, and Leif Schreiber. And Rotten Tomatoes has it at 97% critics and 90% audience. And that is a legacy on the film. So uh, we'll start with Bobby. Bobby, what do you think of the legacy for the film? And would you put this in your top 100? Well, I think that the legacy is fairly fitting for this film. I think it, like we've said before, this is a 60-year-old film that is that foretells the future of 2016 politics in the United States. So, I mean, this is this is a very real, timely uh, film that if you were to watch it today, you'd kind of you'd see some really eerie uh, sin similarities to to current day history. Um, but as far as the um, what I think of the film, I really liked the acting in it. I thought everybody, for the most part, did play their characters extremely well. Uh, there are moments of hokiness because of the it's 1962, not because it's a bad movie, but just because it's it's not of today. Uh, and I think that the Sinatra character. He was a little bit um, unbelievable to me uh, from a logic standpoint, but otherwise he was a, a quite a good character. I really liked Raymond Shaw. I really liked Angela Lansbury's character, and I think overall this is a very good film that absolutely people should see it uh, for no other reason than to know what life would have been like during the, the real Cold War situa situations that were happening in 1962. And I just – I think it's just worth watching today. Is it worth – in my top 100? No. But I would watch this again uh, gladly if anybody brought it up. All right. I'll let Lori go last. I, it's a very, very interesting film. And as I said, I've seen it three or four times. And every time I watch it, I always go, I should like this film much better than I do. Uh, it's a little slow. And it's a little – to me, it's a little dull. I, you know, this time I like the acting a lot better. I was really paying attention to the acting, but I still find it a little slow, a little, a little boring at, at parts. And, and, and then like what Bobby said, like, Hey, we, they didn't show anything about the torture. Not that Bobby was saying they should, they didn't. And so this is a, an abbreviated film of what they could have made, which I think would have made it slower and less interesting. I like the performances. It is a good film. And I agree with Bobby that it's very topical that the, the, the themes and even some of the kind of the, the filmmakers warnings to, to society as a whole are still relevant today. Uh, it still exists of how people can be swayed uh, by, you know, mere conjecture or mere argument uh, as the Senator Iceland character is constantly trying to do it. Uh, you know, it's, it's still, and I joke about social media being a brainwashing aspect, but it is, you know, what, whatever side of the aisle you're on, it's, you know, people tend to believe too much in what they read off social media and don't do their own investigation to, to find out what, what facts are in the first place and, or, or worse, they only listen to the, to the people that they agree with to start with. But ultimately I wouldn't put it in my top 100. It's a very, very good film. Uh, I can see why Laurie would put it there, but uh, as much as I like Frank Sinatra, it's definitely not going to be in my top 100. But it's Laurie's pick, so we'll give her the final word. Well, I'm glad you liked it, and it is in my top 100, and I think it is because of the acting. But also, when I was a kid, like I said, this movie, just I remembered it. 
it it kind of had an effect of kind of like Jaws in the pool that somebody could brainwash me. You you Thankfully. were afraid of sharks in the pool, Lori? <laughs> I was. You weren't? <laughs> no, because it's a pool. There are no sharks I, there. I know there are no sharks there. It didn't say it made sense, but Jaws was scary. <laughs> yeah, for the ocean, not in the pool. <laughs> well, it got me in the pool, too. Maybe that's, yeah. Yeah, I think the legacy is appropriate as well. So thank you for watching it with me. <laughs> no problem, Lori. Anytime. All right. Well, that does it for this month's review of the Manchurian Candidate, the 1962 version. Uh, thanks again for joining us and listening to our little monthly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. As we stated before, you can follow us on Pinterest or Twitter at MH Memories. On either one of those social media media outlets, you can keep yourself informed about our occasional written film reviews and film summaries, news on upcoming theatrical releases and trailers, and information on many upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to our account on YouTube, uh, where we are now releasing our podcasts exclusively. And also don't forget to subscribe to Bobby's YouTube channel, uh, Viewin' and Reviewin', which is view N and review N, right? <laughs> Viewing and reviewing. Viewing. Yes. Hey, I'm a subscriber, so I don't need to find it. That's I get <laughs> updates whenever you post new material. So, and leave comments either on his YouTube channel or ours as to the films you'd like us to review, or uh, even uh, feedback on our podcast. Of course, we always like the p- feedback that is positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that does it for this episode of Movie House Memories. Join us next time when it's Bobby's next pick for one of the greatest films of all time. And he's nominating 1998's The Truman Show, just as Laurie suggested. <laughs> Until then, I'm Patrick. Sorry. I've got my Medal of Honor medal on, and I want to say good. Did Bo- Bobby cut out? Bobby, did you cut out? <laughs> <laughs> no, but the character did. Oh, okay. That was on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Dramatic <got> effect. <laughs> Good night. Yeah, but Lori, they got you with their sharks in the pool, so that's not really hard. It was Steven Spielberg. I'm not ashamed. All right. <laughs> and we'll see you all next time at our house. is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme music for Movie House Memories, Hiding Your Reality, is provided courtesy of Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHM Podcast Network, Movie House Memories, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted. <laughs>